In today's video, I'm going to be looking at the K Omega model. In this talk, I'm going to be going through many different aspects of the K Omega model uh, that you may not have been able to find answers to before. So I'm going to be looking at things like what is Omega physically? What does it represent? How is it different to Epsilon in the K Epsilon model? Uh, when was the K Omega model developed and why was it developed? I'm also going to be looking at the main question, which is how is the K Omega model different to the K Omega SST model? So hopefully I'm going to be answering many questions which you may have about the K Omega model. I'm also going to be looking at a very particular question of what is the free stream turbulence dependency that the K Omega model has that many people cite in their uh, research and in the literature. I'm actually going to go through an example with you to show what this free stream turbulence dependence actually is so that you really understand it by the end of the talk. I know you guys are going to love this talk, uh, particularly if you've enjoyed my previous talks on the K Epsilon model and the K Omega SST model. Uh, so sit back, get a pen and paper and take some notes. I know you're going to find this talk extremely interesting. Okay, so I'm going to start things off with a background for this talk to motivate what we're going to talk about. And as a reminder here, we're talking about uh, RANS turbulence models. And in a RANS turbulence model, what we do is we calculate a turbulent or eddy viscosity mu t, and we use that to close the momentum equations. So if you look at equation one there, that's just the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equations, and we're going to be solving a model to compute mu t, which is highlighted in red there. And that's the standard approach for the RANS models. We solve a separate turbulence model and we use that to compute mu t. And once we have mu t, we can substitute that back into the momentum equations and solve the momentum equations and close the system. And so what we're going to be looking at here is the K omega model, which is one example of a RANS turbulence model, which we can use to compute mu t. Now, to motivate this talk, I'm just going to start off with a brief reminder of the K Epsilon model, which is probably the most popular turbulence model used uh, in current times. And the K Epsilon model was first proposed in 1973. And if you're interested in more detail about the K Epsilon model, you can have a look at my other video for the K Epsilon model, which I go into in a lot more detail. But just as a quick reminder, what we do in the K Epsilon model, we solve two transport equations to compute the turbulent kinetic energy K and the turbulence dissipation rate Epsilon. And you can see those transport equations in equation two and equation three there on the slide. And once we've solved these two transport equations to compute K and Epsilon, we can just use equation four there at the bottom of the slide to compute mu T. And once we have mu t, we just substitute that back into the momentum equations and the system is uh, fully closed and we can solve the RANS equations. So that's how the K epsilon model works, just as a brief reminder. But in today's talk, we're going to be looking at the K omega model, which is slightly different to the K epsilon model. Now, why do we want to look at the K omega model and why was it developed? Well, the K Epsilon model was developed in 1973. It was really the first uh, modern turbulence model that was developed. And numerous uh, experiments and computations have shown that the K Epsilon model is not accurate at predicting uh, boundary layers with adverse pressure gradients. And why is, why is that important? What sort of flow scenarios will that be important for? Well, there are many applications in aerodynamics and turbo machinery where it's very important that we're able to compute the flow field uh, in the presence of an adverse pressure gradient. And some examples of that are aerofoils at high angles of attack. And of course, we have an adverse pressure gradient on the trailing edge of the aerofoil and in internal flow geometries where we have diffusing sections where the area increases. And what this means really is that if we use the K epsilon model uh, and apply it to a case with an adverse pressure gradient, like an aerofoil at high angle of attack, for example, the separation point will be predicted uh, in the wrong place and at the wrong angle of attack. And in practice, what that will mean is that the lift coefficient and the drag coefficient uh, will be significantly incorrect if we compute it with the K epsilon model. And as you may realize, of course, uh, there are many applications for aerofoils in turbo machinery and aerodynamics. And so it's really important that we have a good model for predicting the lift and the drag over aerofoils at high angles of attack. 
So the k epsilon model, which was developed first in 1973, isn't very good at predicting these cases. And so what we need is we need a better turbulence model than the k epsilon model. And this is where the k omega model comes in. And before I go through the k omega model, I'm just going to go through the, a brief history of the k omega model so you can see when it was proposed and why when compared to the other turbulence models. Now, once the performance limitations of the k epsilon model were, were first realized, a number of different models were proposed in order to address these limitations. And you may have heard or come across these models before, like the spalar almaris model, the Johnson-King model, and the K-Omega model. And there were many different models all, pro all proposed around the same time to overcome the same limitations of the K-Epsilon model. But in today's talk, I'm only going to be considering the K-Omega model because that's really one of the most popular models that's still used today. The other, mo the other models are popular, but see less of an application than the K-Omega model. And before I jump into this, it's well worth remembering that there are many different versions of the K-Omega model that have been proposed through time. And so when you select the K-Omega model or choose to use it yourself, it's very important to take note of which version of the model you're using because they're all slightly different. And so what I'm gonna go through now is a quick timeline so you can see the different versions of the model and help you identify which version you've been using. So really, the first version of the K-Omega model was proposed back in 1942, which you can see at the left-hand end of the timeline there. And then moving forward about 30 years to 1970, you can see that in 1973, that's when the K-Epsilon model was first proposed. And following that, you can see clustered around 1990, many different versions of the K-Omega model were then proposed. And these models really developed and built on the earlier versions that were proposed in 1942 and 1974. And perhaps the main one of interest is the version by Wilcox from 1988. And this version is really the version where most of the modern versions are built on this original model. And if you scroll through the timeline there, you can see that the K Omega SST model, which you might also be familiar with, was proposed around the same time in 1992. And you're gonna see why that model was proposed later in this talk. But then if you scroll all the way through to the right hand end of the timeline, you can see that the 2006 version of the Wilcox model is perhaps the most modern and is the most likely version of the model that you'll be using. So the main takeaway point from this slide is really to be aware that there are different versions of the same model with slightly different coefficients. And if you're using it in your simulations and your computations, it's worth working out which version of the model you use. And the best way I've found to be able to do that is if you go to the NASA turbulence modeling page, which is linked in the description for this video, then you can quickly find out which version of the model you're using so you have more confidence in it. So now I've been through the timeline, we can actually jump into the K-Omega model itself and see how it works. Before we do that, we just need to have a think about what physical quantity epsilon and omega actually represent, because this will help us understand how the model works. So epsilon, as you're probably aware, is the turbulence dissipation rate. And what does that mean? It's the rate that turbulent kinetic energy is converted into thermal energy by the action of viscosity. So what I've got for you on the slide here to help you really understand that and what it means is a plot of the turbulent energy cascade, which you may have seen uh, in your lectures or in textbooks. And it describes the amount of energy that is contained within uh, eddies of different size in the turbulence spectrum. And at the left-hand end of the plot, we've got large eddies. And at the right-hand end of the plot, we've got much smaller eddies. And the x-axis is a plot of wave number, which really what you can think of it as is just an inverse of the size of that eddy. So we have larger eddies at the left-hand end and smaller eddies at the right-hand end. And then the plot on the right on the y-axis is just the energy density. So this is how much energy is contained within those fluctuations. And this plot, which you may have seen before, has the characteristic shape where in that central region, uh, you can see that there's a slope or well, the gradient is minus five over three. And that's a fairly universal result which you, which you can look up. But the important thing to take away from this plot is that epsilon, which is the turbulence dissipation rate, occurs at those high wave numbers or the small eddies at the right-hand end of the plot. 
So all of the turbulence is dissipated at the right hand end of the plot with the small eddies, whereas all of the turbulent kinetic energy is contained at the left hand end of the plot with the large eddies. And so what we're doing with epsilon is we're solving an equation to work out the rate that turbulence is dissipated by those large, those small eddies at the right hand end of the plot. So that's what we're doing for epsilon. And in a minute, I'll go on to show you what is omega and how is that related to epsilon. So again, what is epsilon? Well, mathematically, we can write epsilon as you see there in equation five. And epsilon is just the product of the kinematic viscosity and the velocity gradient of those turbulent fluctuations, and it's their product. Now, if we had a time series for the velocity field, we could actually use that to work out what epsilon is. But as we're solving a Rand's turbulence model, remember, we don't actually know what the fluctuations are and what their size is. So we can't calculate epsilon directly using equation five. So what we do instead is we solve a transport equation to calculate what epsilon is directly and that allows us to see what epsilon is throughout the entire flow field. So if you solve the K epsilon model and you look at the field for epsilon, what you're really seeing is the spatial and temporal distribution of epsilon throughout the entire domain. And so areas where epsilon is large indicate that the turbulence dissipation is strong and areas where epsilon is small indicate areas where the turbulence dissipation is a lot smaller. And why would we need, we need to know that? Well, epsilon, of course, we use it to work out the uh, eddy viscosity, but also if we look carefully at the equation for turbulent kinetic energy, that's equation six, you can see that epsilon is actually a sink term on the right-hand side. So you've got a minus rho epsilon in there. So of course, what epsilon is actually doing is it's acting as a, as a sink or it's dissipating turbulent kinetic energy. It's acting as a sink for that energy. And when we look at the flow field, of course, we expect epsilon to be high near walls and in shear layers, because that's where the dissipation of turbulence is going to be high. So that's what epsilon is. Epsilon is acting as a sink or a dissipation of turbulent kinetic energy. And we see that in the equation and in the graph for the energy cascade. But what is omega and how does omega relate to epsilon? Well, omega is actually the specific turbulence dissipation rate. And this is something you may have seen written down before, but may often have not been clear of what it actually means. Well, if you look at equation seven, you can see that omega is actually equal to epsilon, but divided by C mu K. So the important thing to take away from this slide is that omega and epsilon both represent the dissipation of turbulence. And so in areas where epsilon or omega are high, that's where we expect lots of dissipation of turbulence uh, to exist and there to be a large sink term in the equation for turbulent kinetic energy. But all we see here from equation seven is that omega is the same as epsilon, but just divided by C mu K. And C mu is 0 0.09, it's an empirical constant, and K is the turbulent kinetic energy. So both epsilon and omega describe the dissipation rate. They both physically represent the same quantity when you look at the flow field. And another important takeaway from this slide is that we could solve a transport equation for either omega or epsilon, depending on what we decided to choose. Both of them represent the dissipation rate and we can convert between them using equation seven. So you can see that if you solved an equation for epsilon, you could just divide that field by C mu K and that would give you omega. Or if you solved an equation for omega, you could just multiply it by C mu K and that would give you epsilon. So it really doesn't matter which one you choose. They both represent the same thing and you can convert between them quite easily using equation seven. And so what happens if we choose the K omega model instead of the K epsilon model? Well, it turns out the transport equation for the turbulent kinetic energy K is the same. So equation eight is the same as what we've seen before, but now we're solving a transport equation for omega instead of epsilon and that'll be equation nine, which you can see there on the slide. And of course, we can recover epsilon from omega at any point we want using the equation that we saw on the previous slide. So from the thinking that we've done so far, we see that omega and epsilon actually represent the same quantity, really. They both represent dissipation and we can convert between them quite easily. So what's the real difference between the models? Well, the K omega model has different values of the empirical constants. 
and that's alpha, beta, beta star, and sigma k. And you can look up the values of these constants uh, either in a user guide or on the NASA website, and that'll be able to tell you uh, what form of the model uh, you're using. And of course, there are a few other empirical functions in there. But in principle, the k omega model and the k epsilon model are the same. There are just some slight differences between them. So if there are some slight differences between them, why is the k omega model so much better for aerodynamics and turbo machinery? Well, if you've seen my previous talk on the k epsilon model, you'll remember that the k epsilon model has to use empirical damping functions very close to the wall. And that's important for that model to be able to compute the right solution uh, on a flat plate boundary layer. And I've put the uh, empirical damping functions on the slide for you there, just as a reminder. Uh, but if you can't remember them, it's well worth just going back and looking at that previous talk. But the takeaway point from this slide is that the damping functions in the k-epsilon model, so that's equation 10, aren't very accurate in the presence of an adverse pressure gradient. So these damping functions were derived for flat plate boundary layers with no adverse pressure gradient. And it turns out when we do have an adverse pressure gradient, these damping functions aren't very accurate. And the k-omega model does not need these damping functions. And so because it doesn't need the damping functions, it tends to give better accuracy for aerodynamics and turbo machinery. And this has been shown in multiple different test cases in the literature. And so really, if you, if you are solving a flow scenario when you do have an adverse pressure gradient, like a, an aerofoil or a diffusing section, it's much better to choose a k-omega based model than a k-epsilon model for this reason. Now, so far the k-omega model seems fantastic. It offers a lot of improvements on the k-epsilon model. However, it does have some weaknesses. And if you look at papers and resources for the k-omega model in the literature, you'll see that many of these sources claim that the model is dependent on the free stream turbulence conditions. And this is the main weakness of the model. Now, this claim is often stated, but it's not often explained why. Why is the k-omega model dependent on the free stream turbulence conditions? And what does that actually mean? How can we interpret that? Because often it's just stated without being explained. So what I'm going to do for you now is actually go through a quick example which will show you exactly why the k-omega model is dependent on the free stream turbulence conditions so you actually understand it if you choose to apply the model. And so the example problem I'm going to consider here is just boundary layer growth over a flat plate. And this is a fairly standard test case from fluid mechanics. And we've got a free stream Reynolds number of 10 to the 7 and a free stream Mach number of 0.5. And of course, as we expect, we'll have a uniform velocity profile approaching the plate. And then as the velocity profile encounters the flat plate, a boundary layer will develop and grow along the surface uh, with a boundary layer thickness, which you can see there in the diagram. So how do we set up this case in a CFD code? Well, in a CFD code, what we do is we uh, set up a box domain, which you can see here. We've got an inlet on the left, an outlet on the right, and the flow is moving from left to right across the plate. And we can solve this case in 2D if we want to. And on the bottom of the, of the domain, we have a slip wall. So that's zero gradient condition uh, for a short distance downstream of the inlet. And then we have the no slip wall or the start of the plate occurring midway through that domain. And then downstream of the plate, we expect the boundary layer to develop. And to run this case, what we're going to have to do is specify values of k, omega, Mach number, um, and things like that at the inlet to the domain to set off the computation. Now, for this specific example problem, what I want you to think about is we're going to consider the case when the free stream turbulence is negligible. So we've got almost no free stream turbulence uh, in the flow at all. And because we're solving a numerical code, we don't want to set a value of exactly zero. And so we're going to set a very small value of k at the inlet and then a consistent value of omega as well. And of course, what we would expect physically is that if we're setting a very small value that's close to zero, it shouldn't matter how small we make that value. And so I'm going to show you three different values, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 8 and 10 to the minus 10 of k at the inlet and we expect the results to be identical because those free stream conditions are very small. And in practice, what we see with the k-omega model is we see that actually the results are very different uh, depending on the value of the free stream turbulent kinetic energy. 
So the plot that I've got for you here on the slide uh, is taken from a reference paper, which I've linked in the description to this video. And you can always go and have a read of the paper if you want to see the results in full. But in essence, what we see is that if you take a plot uh, normal to the wall, so y plus being the distance normal to the wall, and if you look at the uh, turbulent kinematic viscosity, you see that the profile there is very different depending on if you use a value of 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 8, or 10 to the minus 6. And this tells us that the model is sensitive to small changes in the free stream value of k. So this is typically what researchers mean when they say the k-omega model is sensitive to changes in free stream turbulence conditions. But mu t, that doesn't really tell us a lot. What quantities do we actually care about? So in this slide, I've also shown you a plot of the skin friction coefficient, and that's with distance from the start of the plate. So at the start of the plate, x is zero, and then at the end of the plate, x is equal to L. And you can see that moving along the plate, of course, the skin friction coefficient reduces as the boundary layer develops. And consistent with the previous slide, we see that actually the skin friction coefficient is different depending on if you have a value of 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus eight, or 10 to the minus six. And this is really where the problem in the k omega model comes in, because if we had a case with an adverse pressure gradient, remember, then we get separation at the point where the skin friction coefficient equals zero. And that's clearly going to occur at a different location, depending on the value of our free stream turbulence conditions. So this is the problem with the k omega model. Is there any way around this? How can we fix the free stream uh, dependence on the k omega model? Well, there's actually a trick we can play, uh, which was proposed back in 1992 by Florian Mentor from ANSYS. And the trick is the K epsilon model is not susceptible to the free stream values of turbulence. And so what we can do is start with the K epsilon model far away from the wall in the free stream, where we're not susceptible to small changes in uh, K and omega. And then very close to the wall, we will use the K omega model instead, because it gives much more uh, accurate predictions of uh, the skin friction coefficient and other quantities. And then in between that, we use a blending between the two models. And this idea of using a blend between the two models, having the k epsilon far from the wall and the k omega model close to the wall is the basis of the k omega SST model, which was proposed in 1992. So if you're more interested in the k omega SST model, I'd have a look at my other video where I go into that model in a lot more detail. But really this is, uh, the justification and the reason for wanting to develop the k omega sst model so the final question to ask is really why is there free stream dependence in the k omega model at all where does it come from well since 1998 a number of people have suggested uh, different sources of the free stream dependence uh, some authors suggest that the k omega model is missing the cross diffusion term which you can see there in equation 11 and this term is present in the k omega SST model, but it's not present in the k omega model. And other authors have, have suggested that the model coefficients, which you see in the k omega model, are not tuned correctly. And so if you make small modifications to those coefficients, you can remove uh, the free stream uh, turbulence dependency. However, even though a lot of people have made different suggestions for why uh, the K-omega model has this free stream turbulence dependence, it's not entirely clear. And the current recommendation to this day still remains that the K-omega SST model is preferred for external aerodynamic applications because it doesn't have this free stream turbulence dependence in it. And so still not entirely clear, and that's why it's often recommended that you choose the SST variant. So now just to finish off the talk with a few summary points, as a reminder, Omega is the specific dissipation rate, so it still represents the same physical quantity that epsilon does. However, what we've all we've done is divided by C mu k to convert between them. But both epsilon and omega represent the same physical quantity in the flow field. And the k omega model is more accurate than the k epsilon model when there's an adverse pressure gradient, so the k omega model would be preferred. However, the K-omega model in its original form is sensitive to small changes in the free stream turbulence conditions. And there are a number of ways around this, but the current uh, preferred advice is to use a blend of the K-omega model and the K-epsilon model to get around the free stream turbulence dependence. And this is the basis of the K-omega SST model.
So that brings me to the end of the talk. At this point, I've been through all of the main two equation turbulence models. I've been through the K epsilon model, the K omega model, and the K omega SST model. And I've also done a video on the Spalot Almaris turbulence model. Uh, let me know, did you guys uh, enjoy these talks? Did you find them useful? Uh, are there any other turbulence models or uh, CFD models in particular that you'd like to see me do videos on? Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. If you have any suggestions, uh, leave them in the comment section below. Uh, and I really enjoy reading your comments and I'll get to them as soon as I can. Until next time, thanks for listening.